on the referee. That's what I'm talking about. Blame it on the referee. That's exactly what Adam's response was to sin and speaking to God. He straight away went to, it's the woman that you gave me. He went straight to blaming it on the referee and on the referee's creation, Eve. Now I know when you start talking about victims and when you start talking about blaming, it can be sensitive because some people have genuinely been devastated or hurt or are victims. These days they like to call them survivors in life. But you will never, ever, ever excel while you're looking for reasons and excuses and blaming in any walk of life whatsoever and particularly not in leadership. Because if you're looking for something to blame, a reason, you'll always find one. But leadership is all about accountability. Whether we like it or not, that's why I like to say leadership is always the answer and leadership is always the problem. If I start looking for reasons, I will find many, many reasons, but most of them I can do nothing about. What I can do something about is me. What I can do something about is my leadership, my responses. And so I would encourage everyone here, if you want to do all that you're called to do in life, is understand the importance of responsibility, accountability, refusing to blame, because people are always looking for reasons. In John chapter nine, there was a boy who was blind. Jesus was about to heal him. He'd been blind since birth, but his disciples, they had to find a reason. And so it's in verse one, it says, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Jesus goes on and says that we must keep working while it's day because the night's coming when no one shall work. In other words, let's not be looking for reasons. Let's not be looking for something to blame or something to excuse. Let's just get about and start making a difference. And so if in life, young people in particular, you can understand the importance of not going to the easy default of blaming, you will be so much better off in life because it is contagious. It really does affect a whole culture, a whole environment. If, if blaming, if excusing is in the DNA, if pointing the finger is in the DNA of any church, any staff, any team, then it's gonna pollute that culture because it is contagious. I mean, and, um, you know, the, the guy who, in the Gospel of Luke, he, he basically was gonna throw a party. And so Jesus told the story. And so he, he invited all these people and all of them had reasons why not. One of them said, well, I just bought myself a business. He had bought a cow, he needed to get it working. Another said, I just bought myself a piece of land. He wanted to look after his land, get it ready. He's gonna build a house. So he needed to go and just stare at his land. Another one said, I just got married. He blamed his wife. They all blamed something. But the interesting thing is the verse, Luke 14, I think it's uh, verse 18 says, they all with one accord began to make excuses. And so in other words, it polluted all of them. They all in one accord. In the NIV it says, they all alike began to blame and whether or not they all conspired beforehand because they were in one accord or whether they just all had the same spirit. All I know is that you tend to get blame in one area of a department, say in church life, you'll start getting it across all areas of that department in church life. And so just some things about blame. It shifts responsibility, whereas obviously accountability accepts responsibility. Blame projects. These are all LED screens, but in the old days, of course, and back there where it's still antiquated, you had projectors up in the uh, roof and they forcefully project whatever's in them onto a screen. Do you know a lot of people, that's how they live their life. And that's what blaming tends to do, it projects. It's the whole, the three fingers pointing back at you type thing, where it is so easy to basically cover whatever's going on in our world by starting to point the finger at somebody else. And I, I just feel like every person who doesn't want to confront themselves usually will project their issues onto other people. And, and that's always a sad way, I think, to live your life. Psalm 15 verse three in the message says, don't hurt your friend. Don't blame your neighbour. That's called projecting. And in life, it's easy to project. And sometimes we don't even understand that that's what we're doing. That we start projecting onto other people things that are really going on in our own world. Pastors who seem to be absolutely fixated, you know, sometimes with immorality. Sadly, sometimes they're, they're just projecting. 
They're actually preaching at themselves and they're preaching to other people stuff that's going on in their own lives. So let's not live our lives projecting. Blame is self-justifying. You know, justified is a legal term and it obviously means free from guilt. And the obvious example of it is Jesus, who was the ultimate taking accountability by taking the sins of the world onto himself. And what did he do? He justified us, which means it's just as if I'd never sinned. But what is ugly is self-justification. Self-justification is when we continually justify everything that we do. It kind of says, well, you know, the reason that that happened is, I, I know that, but I wouldn't do that except for this happened. And so because of that, I, that's justifying. Saul in the Old Testament was, he was a, uh, a master at self-justification. Samuel, who was a prophet, gave him one instruction, whatever you do, you know, don't go to battle till I come back. Samuel was gone for seven days. And he said, whatever you do, don't, don't burn the offering, don't give an offering before I come back. And so seven days went by and there was no sign of Samuel. So Saul takes things into his own hands. And even though he was given clear instruction, listen to what the Bible says, 1 Samuel 13, verse 11 to 14. And Samuel said, what have you done? He's talking to Saul. Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Mishmash, that's a funny name for a city, isn't it? Mishmash. Then I said, the Philistines will now come down. This this is now Saul justifying. Then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I've not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Then Samuel said to Saul, you've done stupidly, foolishly. You've not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. In other words, this is costing him his kingdom. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people. So God was gonna raise up David and gonna command him to be commander over God's people. And this is all about leadership. Saul is a leader. He was so good at self-justifying. He said, well, because this happened, because that happened, you didn't come and, you know, I was afraid. And so I felt compelled. That's self-justification. And uh, sadly, if you live your life self-justifying, again, it's only gonna be a hindrance to you stepping into all that God has for you. Blame excuses. It not only projects and self-justifies, it excuses, obviously. And uh, you know, if you're looking for it, as I've already said, there's always a reason. Ed Cole, who was a great old guy who had an incredible ministry for men, he said, if you accept someone's rationalization of their problem, you accept their problem. And so talking about that and putting it on ourselves, if you accept the rationalization of your problem, then you accept the problem. And I feel like sometimes, even though rationalizing may make a whole lot of sense, it just doesn't help you. It just doesn't help you. And again, it's pointless rationalizing things that you have no control over. What I can change is me. And what you can change is you. So let's not live our life excusing. There was that guy who was 38 years, 38 years uh, beside the water and he couldn't get into the waters, the healing waters, because other people kept beating him to them. So for 38 years, 38 years, think about that. 38 years, that's six years longer than I've been pastoring this church. 38 years he lay there waiting for his time. And so Jesus asked him, what looks like a silly question, do you want to be made whole? It's actually a great question, because you think about it. Well, that guy's been lying there 38 years. He had, no, he had a, every excuse to not be able to move, and do what maybe he would love to do in life. He had every reason, every excuse not to move forward. And the moment he was made whole, all the excuses disappear. Now he has no reason why he can't get out there and start fulfilling God's purpose and living a life of victory and a life of overcoming. And so I always think it's a good question, even for people who have genuinely been victimised or hurt, do you want to be made whole? Because wholeness comes with a responsibility. Suddenly your crutch has disappeared. Suddenly you're not walking with a limp anymore. And so accountability comes into it. And leadership is accountability. And no matter what level of leadership you're at, it is so easy to slip back into finding reasons, blaming it's because of that, or it's because of the spirit in the air, it's because of the devil, it's because of the church down the road, it's because of the weather, you know, it's because of something. There's always something. And so let's 
get rid of the excuses. James 1.14 in the message, the temptation to give in to evil comes from us and only us. We have no one to blame, but the leering, seducing flare up of our own lust. That's talking obviously about giving in to sin. But it's saying we have no one to blame, but the leering, seducing flare up of our own lust. <laughs> blame is not only excusing, number four, blame is accusing. That's again what Adam did. He said, the woman that you gave me. So it was God, it was the woman, then ultimately it was the serpent, verse 13. The serpent deceived me and I ate. And so he was accusing Eve, he was accusing the snake, he was accusing God even. The only person he didn't accuse is himself. And it's called shifting responsibility. You see, the thing is about that original sin story is they knew the rules. God had told them real clear, you can have all the trees, you can have everything except for one tree in the middle of the garden. They knew all the rules and they knew the consequences. They were told that if you touch that tree, you'll die. And ultimately they had a choice. And so even after Eve had fallen at him, he had a choice. And so it's so easy to project. And it's interesting to me that the first reaction to sin was to start to blame. Because I think that when we start blaming, projecting, excusing, self-justifying, accusing, that really what we are doing is uh, sadly just living out of our sin nature. And so our sin nature, you, you, when you, you, your human nature is at work, you don't even see it as an issue. You, often you don't even see it as a challenge or a problem in your life. But don't underestimate the undermining effect of blame when it comes to God's purposes in your life. <laughs> blame is accusing, blame is denying. I don't have a problem, there's, there's nothing wrong with me, so it must be you, uh, anyone or anything but me. And oftentimes blame, blaming is just filled with self-denial. And it's incredible how we can talk ourselves into denying that any of these issues are ours. Job chapter five, verse six, look at the message, I like this. And Job, of course, he had all these challenges and so on. But look at this verse, it says, don't blame fate when things go wrong. Trouble doesn't come from nowhere. And you know, sometimes in life, things come people's way that it's not your fault. You don't deserve it. It's not your fault. You couldn't do anything about it. It was external. It just came at you and it came at the worst time. And so there are times when obviously not everything is our fault. But if we could look at that verse one more time, it, just, it says trouble doesn't come from nowhere. And uh, well, I just really feel like it is so easy to blame, but generally if something keeps on going around in a cycle, you gotta start looking at yourself. Trouble doesn't come from nowhere. Trouble doesn't come from nowhere. And so any church at any time can have challenges and disappointments and things goes wrong, but blame is filled with denial and self-denial and denying. So the other thing about blame is it's, it's, it's positioning. I'll tell you what I mean by this. It, it sadly sometimes can mean in the weird way that people are wired and in their insecurities, that I can make myself look better if I make you look worse. So I start blaming you and somehow if people think less of you, they're gonna think more of me. Well, I'll tell you right now, life never ever works like that. And as a matter of fact, that's usually paper thin. And so people see through it extremely, extremely quickly. But uh, that thought that I'll feel better about me if I can reduce you, uh, it, it is just a sad thing inside any person's heart. If you feel insecure about maybe someone who you think's prettier than you or someone who whatever, you know, maybe a boy likes more than you and you start trying to put them down because you think somehow putting them down or blaming them or pointing the finger at them is gonna somehow lift you up. Uh, you know, sometimes young people's games, those things go on in our hearts and in our lives. Well, I'll tell you right now, it's, it's just not gonna work. You, all you do is hurt them and you don't look better at all. You always look worse. You always look worse when you start blaming, you start pointing the finger at other people. You never look better by trying to get that kind of gratification. So blame is positioning number seven. Blame uh, is scheming sometimes. You're just looking for a reason. You've got a big radical action perhaps you wanna take. And all you need is something to blame, a catalyst, so that you can bust out of your marriage or so that you can bust out of church life or so that you can whatever. So you're just looking for something to blame. 
And in life, sadly, sometimes people, they've, they've already gone. So let's say it's about church life. They've already gone in their heart. And once someone's already gone in their heart, often they'll try to find something to blame. It might be something trivial, something small that can become the catalyst that excuses them taking a radical action. The sad thing about that, of course, is that especially if it comes to leaving, leaving a marriage, leaving a church, leaving anything, that the way you leave usually determines, uh, you know, the impact of what you enter. And so many people, their future is hindered because of basically what was going on in their heart, refusing to take responsibility, finding someone else to blame, finding something else to blame. Number eight, don't worry, I've only got 27. (laughs) Blame is isolating. So if you're the problem, you offended me, then I've got every reason to put up the shutters and ice you out, freeze you out. It's a pity when some people in life, they actually do that. They basically put up or pull down the shutters and they basically put up the walls and emotionally, maybe even they've still got to go to work with you every day, but you know that as far as your connection or your relationship is concerned, they have long departed. The shutters are well and truly up. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the lights are on, but nobody's home. And I I think that oftentimes people, they build those walls into their lives because they're blaming. They see other people as the problem. So because they see other people as the problem, they have every reason to isolate them. A lot of people spend more time placing the blame than rectifying the problem. And uh, the moment we start thinking, I can't change. I found reasons why I can't, I'm excusing. I'm a victim, Uh, it's because of them, it's not because of me. Uh, The moment you you believe you can't change, you accept the status quo. And the moment you accept the status quo, you're gonna fail to step up to be all that God called you to be. And who He has called you to be is awesome. What He wants to do in your life is awesome. The places He can take you are further than you could ever imagine. But there has to be an openness to change and blaming forfeits the power to change. You know, salvation itself, it's if you confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But how does it start? If you confess your sins. You see, if you confess your sins, then it triggers the grace of God and all the power and the wonder of God. But it starts with deciding that I need to change. If you confess your sins, it's the power behind the gospel. And in that you're washed white. You gotta change your blame. Change is dependent on responsibility. Blame refuses to take responsibility. Change is dependent on hard work. Blame doesn't want the hard work. Change confronts the real issues. Blame doesn't want to deal with real issues. Change says, I must admit the truth. Blame says, I'd rather live a lie. And so, you know, when you get older, your metabolism changes. Everyone knows it, it slows down. It slows down. And so, uh, I've got a reason, haven't I? And as long as I believe that, I can't change. I cannot change. So do I belong to my metabolism or does my metabolism belong to me? Honestly, there's there's always reasons not to change and we won't change if we're looking for reasons why not. But if we start deciding I'm gonna live my life accountability and leadership is accountability. And so when Saul couldn't take accountability, then the Lord had to find another commander over the other people because Saul was basically standing down from abdicating what is one of the great key pillars and foundations of leadership. And so I would encourage every person here, no matter what stage of life you are at, to understand the importance of not blaming, not accusing, taking responsibility. You know, I think sometimes rather than blame, even when you may be right, a real strong person takes accountability, even when perhaps it wasn't their fault because they just, they're not gonna live their life pointing and blaming 
and excusing. And the moment you get that whole spirit of blaming, finding a reason, excusing, uh, sometimes lying to cover your own mistakes and so on, or telling half-truths to cover your own mistakes. If that is inside a team, then sadly it's, it's kind of insidious and it will stunt progress for sure. Not only will it stunt your progress, but it will stunt the overall collective progress. And that's why I thank God, I think overall we do have a team and a staff who are pretty good at accountability. Maybe not always historically, but these days I sense that people are great at just taking things on board, taking responsibility. I know as a leader, uh, I think that one of the things I find the most frustrating is people won't accept blame. They just won't take accountability. There is always a reason. There's always someone else's fault. It was always the other department. It was never me because I just know how damaging that that actually is. What do you mean blaming and excusing? Justifying, self-justifying, projecting, you know, basically just going into denial over perhaps, maybe for those on team, you know, just a weakness in the way you work. Uh, I wonder if there's anything like that where we can say, hey, I'm going to start taking responsibility. Maybe it's a personal habit, something in your own life, something that you do have reasons. That there is justification, but remember, you'll never change. You'll never ever change if you don't take accountability. It's so easy to paint ourselves as a victim. Listen to Ezekiel 18, verse two to four. And, and I think there's a great little proverb that is given here. What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, here it is, look, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. It's all about basically children blaming fathers and saying the fathers ate sour grapes. You know, my dad was an alcoholic and that's why I'm an alcoholic too. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And then it goes on and it says, what do you mean, <laughs> as I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. This is God speaking, behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. So don't blame your dad. Don't blame your mum. Don't blame whoever. You can't say because that one ate sour grapes. That's why my teeth are set on edge. That's, that's what this verse is saying. I'll finish with this. There's a woman called Kelly Graham who said, you can't blame the water for finding the hole in the boat. You can't blame the water for finding the hole in the boat. So think about that in leadership. Life's conspiring against you. You know, uh, the town where you are, the suburb where you are, you can't get a building. People aren't, people aren't committed enough. But you can't blame the water for finding the hole in the boat. What you've got to do is fix the hole in the boat. <laughs> Romans chapter 14, verse 13, one final scripture. Then let us no more criticise and blame. And blame, is that saying enough? Let us no more criticise and blame and pass judgment on one another, but rather decide and endeavour never to put a stumbling block or an obstacle or a hindrance in the way of a brother. So it's saying no more. Let us no more criticise and blame uh, and pass judgment on one another, but rather decide. And so I want to encourage everyone here to decide. I'm responsible for my life. I'm responsible for my spirit in this team. I'm responsible for my work output and for my effectiveness. I'm responsible for my marriage. I'm responsible for my life. I'm responsible for my finances. Because we know it's the bigger bad tax man and it's this and it's that and the other thing. But, you know, end of the day, you can blame a partner who ripped you off. You can blame so many different things. But when it comes to your finances, if you don't take accountability there, there will always be a reason why you won't be fruitful and why you won't progress and why you won't go forward. If you're always in debt, if you're always in debt, it's not the circumstances fault. If you're a student, you're struggling, you're wondering how you're gonna pay your fee, you know that could be a season, so it's not really what I'm talking about. But if you never pay your fees, if you're always over 30 days in paying your bills, if you're always, you know, basically trying to withdraw money that's not even there any longer to withdraw, and you're always trying to use one credit card to pay the other one, to pay off the other one, to keep the other one afloat, it's not how life works. You'll never ever change if you don't take accountability. 
But I always love it when I get the chance to speak to our students and to our staff and team because I feel like I can speak right into the heart and the soul of Hillsong Church staff and of course our college. But I also am so glad I had the chance to include you. I was talking about blame and how that we can live our lives hiding behind blame rather than taking responsibility and accountability. But the truth is, the more I can take responsibility for my life, then I have power to change. I can't change other things that maybe I can look at as excuses, but I can change me with the help of the Holy Spirit. So you be blessed. You have a great week and I hope you join us again next time. Don't forget, your best is yet to come.